Welcome to SCOTUS Cast, Securities Act and Statutes of Repose Edition. Thank you for tuning in. On April 17, 2017, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in California Public Employees Retirement System v. ANZ Securities. Between July 2007 and January 2008, Lehman Brothers raised over $31 billion through debt offerings. California Public Employees Retirement System, the largest pension fund in the country, purchased millions of dollars of these securities. CalPERS sued Lehman Brothers in 2011, and their case was merged with another retirement fund's putative class action suit against the Lehman Brothers and transferred to a New York district court. Later that year, the other parties settled, but CalPERS decided to pursue its own claims individually. The district court dismissed for untimely filing, and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit affirmed. The question now before the Supreme Court is whether the filing of a putative class action serves under the American Pipe and Construction Co. v. Utah rule to satisfy the three-year time limitation in Section 13 of the Securities Act with respect to the claims of putative class members. To discuss the case, we have Paul Stansill, who is professor of law at Brigham Young University. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues, all expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And to now, Professor Stansill. It's taken some time for all of the cases relating to the 2008 mortgage crisis to win their way through the federal courts. The CalPERS case, argued on April 17, 2017, is one of many such cases. Uh, But CalPERS versus ANZ really isn't about the mortgage crisis. Instead, it's about a series of extremely difficult procedural questions, all of which arise out of the evolution of the class action over the last half century. In particular, CalPERS asks how far the court should extend a curious 1974 Supreme Court case called American Pipe, which held that the commencement of a class action suspends the applicable statute of limitations as to all asserted members of the class who would have been parties had the suit been permitted to continue as a class action. At a more philosophical level, CalPERS v. ANZ represents a fight between formalism and pragmatism. It's also about stare decisis and the extent to which members of the court are willing to ignore or distort Supreme Court precedent in the pursuit of either their pragmatic or their policy goals. And CalPERS v. v. ANZ presents us with an opportunity to watch the court wrestle with the slippery boundary between procedural and substantive in a context in which well-established principles and a statute called the Rules Enabling Act dictate that the court remains safely on the procedural side of the line. As briefed and argued before the Supreme Court, CalPERS presents two interesting questions. One, will the court continue to recognize important differences between statutes of limitation and statutes of repose? And two, if so, how will the Supreme Court reconcile its obvious preference for streamlining litigation with the complexity increasing implications of that distinction? Now I'll come back to those questions in a bit. Uh, In order to understand the issues involved in the CalPERS case, we're going to have to get down in the weeds a little. Uh, Let's start by exploring the background of the case itself. Now, this case arises out of a 2006 securities registration statement that Lehman Brothers issued in connection with the sale of over $30 billion in debt and equity securities. Most of those were related in some way to Lehman Brothers' investment in subprime mortgages and other risky real estate plays. Just before Lehman filed for bankruptcy protection in 2008, a retirement fund, not CalPERS, by the way, uh, filed a putative class action alleging securities law violations with respect to 30 different debt offerings sold under that registration. In addition to Lehman and its officers and directors, this lawsuit also named ANZ and other underwriters as defendants. The lawsuit claimed that the 2006 statement was false and misleading because it relied upon Lehman Brothers' financial statements that grossly overstated the value of Lehman's assets and that misrepresented both Lehman's true leverage position and its credit risk. Now, the timing of these cases is governed by a somewhat unique two-tiered statutory framework. Paraphrasing slightly, Section 13 of the Securities Act states, No action shall be maintained unless brought within one year after the discovery of the untrue statement or omission, or after such discovery should have been made by the exercise of reasonable diligence. Now, given the way that the subprime mortgage crisis unfolded, no one is challenging the timing of the original plaintiff's 2008 lawsuit. Everyone concedes it was filed within one year of the discovery uh, of the fact that Lehman's 2006 registration statement contained false and misleading information. But the current Supreme Court case is about the second sentence of Section 13, which states, and again, I'm paraphrasing only slightly, 
in no event shall any such action be brought more than three years after the security was offered to the public. One of the questions the court is dealing with in this case is what exactly this two-tiered timing structure means. Now, as those who follow securities litigation know, CalPERS is the state of California's public employee retirement system. CalPERS currently manages almost $300 billion in assets and has a well-deserved reputation as an activist investor. CalPERS frequently leads the charge in shareholder efforts to change publicly held corporations' management or to change corporate governance structure, and CalPERS is also a frequent litigant in securities cases. Importantly, CalPERS often strikes its own deals with the alleged corporate wrongdoers. Its investment portfolio is big enough to give it that kind of leverage. Now, as you recall, CalPERS was not a named plaintiff in the original and timely 2008 lawsuit, nor was it a plaintiff in any of the 16 or so additional actions that plaintiffs filed quickly thereafter across the country. But it definitely owned some of the 30 different Lehman debt offerings listed in that lawsuit, so it absolutely was a member of the putative class asserted in that first case. Here's what happened next. CalPERS did nothing. Well, it did nothing for almost two and a half years anyway. In early 2009, the securities cases then pending against Lehman were consolidated into a multi-district or MDL proceeding in the Southern District of New York for pretrial purposes. Other plaintiffs filed other lawsuits, and those too were transferred to the MDL court. But CalPERS simply allowed the initial class action lawsuit and the other consolidated proceedings to continue slowly working their way through the federal court system. This lasted until February 2011, at which point CalPERS filed its own individual lawsuit in the Northern District of California against the same basic list of defendants. It is undisputed that CalPERS waited, quote, more than three years after the security was offered to the public, end quote, to file its claim. The CalPERS case was also consolidated into the MDL proceeding for pretrial purposes. Now, shortly after CalPERS initiated its own lawsuit, uh, the judge in the consolidated MDL proceeding issued a series of important rulings. While the original class action remained intact, Judge Kaplan wrote three separate opinions dismissing various plaintiffs' claims because they had been filed after the expiration of the three-year period described in the second sentence of the statute's timing provision. And we're going to come back to these rulings. But in the meantime, settlement negotiations between the original class action plaintiff and the various defendants heated up. In December of 2011, the underwriters, which includes the company ANZ, uh, agreed to pay class members around $417 million subject to court approval. Now, before the court gave its approval, CalPERS exercised its right to opt out of the settlement. In May 2012, uh, CalPERS gave notice that it wished to be excluded from that settlement, even though it knew that the district court had dismissed three other similarly situated plaintiff's claims because they had been filed more than three years after Lehman had issued the relevant securities. Once CalPERS opted out, the defendants moved to dismiss its Section 11 individual claims as time barred. The judge agreed with those defendants, dismissing some of CalPERS Section 11 claims in October 2012. And the Second Circuit uh, ultimately agreed with the district judge, affirming one of his three earlier dismissals in 2013. Shortly thereafter, the district court dismissed the rest of CalPERS individual claims as untimely. CalPERS appealed and the Second Cir Circuit affirmed. The Supreme Court granted cert on the following question. Whether the filing of a putative class action serves under the American Pipe Rule to satisfy the three-year time limitation in Section 13 of the Securities Act with respect to the claims of putative class members. Now, notwithstanding the limited scope of the cert grant, CalPERS chose to brief and argue the case on somewhat broader grounds. In essence, CalPERS made two discrete arguments. First, it argued that the filing of the putative class action in 2008 served under American Pipe to satisfy the three-year period. This is basically just saying, uh, yes, we win under the question presented. But then they also go on, second, to argue that its mere membership, CalPERS mere membership in the putative class identified in the initial 2008 lawsuit, remember a lawsuit in which it did not participate in any way until it announced it was opting out of the settlement, uh, that that membership in that class meant that it had, quote, commenced, end quote, its lawsuit as of that date, and that it had maintained its action without interruption since. Now, these two arguments sound remarkably similar, but they're not. 
um, the Supreme Court has historically distinguished between statutes of limitations and statutes of repose. While the precedents establishing the distinction may not be as clean and clearly articulated as I would prefer, the rationale behind the distinction is clear. A statute of repose strongly indicates substantive, that's substantive, congressional intent to provide defendants with a safe harbor from late filed litigation without regard for some of the other more pragmatic concerns that motivate statutes of limitations. Unfortunately for CalPERS, uh, existing Supreme Court precedent on the distinction between statutes of limitation and statutes of repose more or less point, paint the court into a corner, at least with respect to the actual question on which the court granted cert. Let's walk through the steps. In 2014, in a case called CTS v. Wahlberger, Justice Kennedy's majority opinion specifically stated that, unlike statutes of limitations, statutes of repose are not subject to judicial extension or equitable tolling, quote, even in cases of extraordinary circumstances, end quote. And this followed a 1991 opinion called LAMPF, in which Justice Blackmun stated that the three-year component of the one-year slash three-year structure of Section 13 of the Securities Act was a statute of repose, not a statute of limitations. Moreover, both of these cases suggested that the distinction had important separation of powers implications. The main thrust of a statute of limitations, the court said, is, quote, to encourage the plaintiff to pursue his rights diligently, and when an extraordinary circumstance prevents him from bringing a timely action, the restriction imposed by the statute of limitation does not further the statute's purpose. Now, by contrast, a statute of repose is a, quote, judgment that defendants should be free from liability after the legislatively determined period of time beyond which liability will no longer exist and will not be told for any reason. In order to prevail on the actual issue on which the court granted cert, CalPERS would thus have to potentially overcome two separate, relatively recent Supreme Court opinions. And it could win by persuading the court that the one-year, three-year provision in 16, Section 13 does not establish a three-year repose period. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has already held that the three-year deadline is a statute of repose. CalPERS might also win by persuading the court that statutes of repose should also be subject to equitable tolling or other judicial extensions, including a judicial extension that would extend American pipe from the statute of limitations context into the statute of repose context. But the Supreme Court has already said that statutes of repose are not subject to such extension. So where does that leave the petitioners on their first argument? Well, they attempt to argue that American pipe arises out of the federal rule of civil procedure 23 that governs class actions, and that American pipe thus states a legal rule rather than a rule of equitable tolling. But this runs into a couple problems. First, the court has said several times that American pipe is an equitable rule. Um, second, nothing in American pipe ties its holding to the text of rule 23, and most important, perhaps, the Supreme Court, under the Rules Enabling Act, is expressly prohibited from making substantive law by way of ostensibly procedural rules. To interpret Rule 23 to allow lawsuits that are otherwise barred by a statute of repose would arguably violate that prohibition. As a result, CalPERS focuses much attention on two interrelated additional arguments that don't, at first blush, appear to fall within the scope of the CERT grant. One is theoretical, the other is practical. At the theoretical level, CalPERS claims that the initial 2008 class action constituted commencement of the action as to CalPERS, such that it has always had a timely action filed. Relatedly, CalPERS claims that this approach to the problem is the best possible practical solution because to decide otherwise would ultimately do nothing more than produce mountains of additional paperwork for district courts overseeing securities class actions. While the empirical data may or may not back CalPERS up on that issue, they do have a good point in theory. If respondent prevails, many investors that are members of putative classes will feel compelled to move to intervene as named plaintiffs just to make certain that they preserve the right to pursue their own actions at some later date. Now, while respondents are understandably upset about the holdout practices of CalPERS and other large institutional investors, that is, waiting until class actions encompassing their claims are close to settlement and then withdrawing from the settlement class to extract more money from the defendants as holdouts, adopting respondents' position would not solve that problem. 
it would encourage institutional investors to become named plaintiffs in a, time, in a timely lawsuit early on, but wouldn't prevent them from later withdrawing from a settlement class to extort their own peace. Now, respondents pursued several lines of attack in, condition, in connection with the petitioner's second position. First, they argued it just was beyond the cert grant. Uh, second, they made semantic arguments that the definition of action in the statute could not be stretched far enough to make a class action complaint filed by different plaintiffs in New York the same, quote, action, end quote, as an individual suit filed by CalPERS in the Northern District of California. Third, they argued that there was little evidence of a flood of additional paperwork in the Second Circuit since the Second Circuit had decided uh, in the respondent's favor in the 2013 case. And finally, they argued that petitioner's proposed rule would provide additional incentive for wealthy institutional investors to, and I'm quoting here, treat class actions as little more than tools to leverage for their own individual benefit, uh, end quote, by allowing large institutional investors to free ride off a class action for years, then opting out at the last minute. Respondents contended that this would uh, negatively affect the small investors that the statute, uh, that the securities laws are intended to protect. Now, oral argument at this case seemed to follow a pretty traditional script. Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan all seemed generally sympathetic to CalPERS positions, if perhaps for different reasons. Sotomayor focused primarily on the burdens that respondents' approach would place on district judges and on parties in the form of additional intervention filings, etc. Uh, Kagan, by contrast, seemed willing to reopen the question of whether the three-year period in the statute was a statute of repose at all, or instead just an attempt to cut off the discovery rule at three years. Justice Ginsburg asserted that American Pipe was not an equitable tolling opinion uh, and that the Clayton Act provision at issue in American Pipe itself actually involved similar language and therefore should prov provide the rule of decision. Uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, Justice Breyer kept his, close, uh, his cards close to the vest, but he did seem a little bit skeptical of Calper's second theory. Now, Justice Alito focused on the semantics, posing hypotheticals intended to demonstrate that the word action could only be stretched so far. Justice Roberts participated only minimally, but seemed at least willing to entertain the idea that the purpose of statutes of repose was effectively notice of claims and the avoidance of surprises, and that since the defendants here were already on notice of the claims, um, he seemed to suggest that there might be little harm in allowing CalPERS to proceed in its action. Swing Justice Kennedy also seemed at least a little skeptical of CalPERS positions and was the only justice who seemed interested in whether adopting CalPERS proposed approach would effectively create a substantive right that violated the Rules Enabling Act. One final note. This case was argued on the first day that Associate Justice Gorsuch sat with the court to hear oral arguments. His colloquy with the petitioners demonstrated two things in my view. First, he seems to be serious about a textual approach. He and petitioners' counsel spent several minutes going back and forth about the meaning of the term action versus the meaning of the term claim. Second, he was prepared. In a brief exchange regarding a case of only tangential relevance to the case, it quickly became clear that Gorsuch had done his homework. Uh, he pushed back hard on the characterization Calper's counsel offered. I offer no predictions regarding the likely outcome of this case. From my vantage point, it was too close to call, and the likely swing voters gave no real indication of the direction in which they were leaning. Uh, in my view, CalPERS v. ANZ Securities will eventually teach us much more about the way the current court thinks about a lot of different big-picture issues, uh, but only once we see the actual opinion. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cast. For more episodes of Cast, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.fedsoc.org slash multimedia.